let's get started. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. My name is Mark Longo. I'm one of the organizers of the Complexity Group. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Melanie Mitchell is a professor of computer science at Portland State University, where she is also on the faculty of the System Science Graduate Program. That's one of the very few uh, PhD granting system science programs in the US, uh, actually in the world for that matter, which is a little strange given how important systems thinking has become in the sciences and elsewhere. For those of you new to the study of uh, complex systems, the field of complexity is largely an incarnation of systems movements that have been running in a parallel with more specialized academic systems for, uh, for quite a while now. Um, speaking of complexity, Molly is also on the science board at the Santa Fe Institute, where she's an external professor. The Santa Fe Institute, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the epicenters of complex systems research. She is also the author, uh, in addition to numerous scientific articles, of uh, an award-winning book in which she goes over a number of uh, aspects of the field of complexity. It's called Complexity at Tor. And uh, her research focuses primarily on artificial intelligence and cognitive science. Today, she's going to discuss some work her lab is doing in trying to enable computers to understand images using an analogy. And with that, let's welcome Melanie Mitchell. Okay. okay, thanks a lot. And thanks to uh, the complexity group here for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my some of my recent work that is very much work in progress. It's probably different from the typical complex systems talk in that it's about uh, analogy, which doesn't come up that often. Um, so in 1966, Marvin Minsky, who was the uh, director of the Artificial Intelligence uh, Lab at MIT, he asked his undergrad student, Gerald Sussman, to, quote, spend the summer linking a camera to a computer and getting the computer to describe, describe what it saw. Okay, so that was like a summer project for an undergrad. Um, and later on, Minsky noted that what we've learned 50 years later or more is that quote, easy things are hard. So this notion of getting a computer to describe what it saw sounds, on the face of it, very easy. We can easily look out at the world and describe what we see. Any, you know, two-year-old, once they learn to talk, they start talking about what they're seeing. And yet, it turned out that that very, quote, easy thing, easy for humans, to, is extremely hard for computers, perhaps the most difficult um, challenge for artificial intelligence is trying to uh, interpret visual input at, in the same way that humans are able to. So computer visions turned out to be one of the hardest easy things. And so here's a here's an image understanding task. Okay, um, this could this could be uh, thought of as kind of a one of those captchas, which um, are tasks that are easy for humans but computers can't do. It's not yet. So you describe what is going on in each of these. Or how you would describe this picture. So what's what's the what's the concept that's being illustrated here? People walking dogs. People walking dogs, right. Okay. So that's extremely easy. Everybody knows that. Okay. So what we're trying to do is um, build computer systems that can um, make sense of visual situations like this. So this involves a, a, a combination of low-level vision which might be um, uh, recognizing colors, textures, elementary shapes, edges, and so on. And high-level cognition, which is using knowledge, prior knowledge about situations, like people walking dogs, to actually take that um, large uh, group of data that the lower-level vision system has, has perceived and make sense of it in terms of concepts that uh, the higher level cognitive system knows about. So that's our goal. So low level vision involves things like color, shape, texture, maybe simple segmentation, which means finding sort of regions in the image that might correspond to objects. And object recognition, 
that might also be part, part of a sort of higher level than slow level, but it's something that people in uh, computer vision work on quite a bit. And then there's high level perception, which involves things like pattern recognition, such as uh, this, is, uh, this is a human, uh, this is a, a human walking, or something like that. Analogy making, that is seeing that all of those different instantiations of people walking dogs were really instances of the same concept, even though superficially they all look very different. And finally, extracting what we might call meaning or semantics, that is recognizing that that is an instance of something that has meaning to us. Okay, so that's very kind of uh, a fuzzy notion, but it's what AI right now seems to be completely lacking. So the question is how do we uh, get across this so-called semantic gap that, um, that lays between this more low level visual um, processing and higher level cognition. And so the idea is uh, what we're doing in my group is we're taking two models one of the low level and one of the high level, and we're trying to marry them. And the low level one is uh, a model that was developed at MIT called the HMAX model of the visual cortex by uh, Ryzen Hubert and Poggio and others. And the uh, high level model is the active symbol architecture of Hofstetter et al. And I'll tell you about both, both of those. The idea is to build a bridge between them. So that's what my research is currently. Uh, pursuing. So let me tell you a little bit about this HMAX model. And uh, let me just ask, is anybody in, in, in here a computer vision person? A little bit. Okay. So not, not too many. Um, so I'll try and be pr uh, pretty non-technical about this. So the idea here is um, HMAX is kind of a neural network model in that it's trying to, uh, at a very rough level, uh, imitate the way the brain processes visual information. So we start out with an image here, it happens to be a grayscale image, and um, then it starts going through the, so the, the artificial visual cortex. Um, and this is a, a layer of simulated neurons. So this, this, this uh, neural network has different layers through which the information goes, just like in the brain, the information goes from the retina back to the uh, an area called V1, which does sort of edge detection-like activities, and then up to higher layers in sequence. So um, this is a, a, a bunch of different edge detectors that are going to look at the small parts of the image, image and try and figure out what the edges are, different edges of different directions and sizes. So for instance, it might look here and see a kind of horizontal edge or here on the dog's ear has sort of an edge that has a certain angle to it. And that's this whole collection of cells is going to try and uh, represent those edges. Then um, the next layer, the, the, it's called S1 because these are meant to model what are called simple cells in uh, uh, the brain or visual cortex, which um, are sensitive to a particular uh, input, like a particular edge. So you might know that you have neurons that are very sensitive to particular edges with certain orientations. And so you have a neuron that every time in, your, in its particular part of the visual field, it sees a vertical line, it lights up, it starts firing. It's very happy, whereas other neurons don't care. They have other edges that they light up for. And those implement what's called um, specificity in that each cell is very specific about what input it's going to fire on. Here, an edge of a certain orientation. And the next layer gives a kind of what's called invariance, which is these cells, which are called complex cells in the brain, and I'm walking here, I have a very you know, rough model of them, uh, they input information from groups of the S1 cells, and they, um, at different locations that have different, what are diff different uh, areas in the visual field, 
and they take the, the um, activation that is the maximum in a small area. And so what they're saying is, suppose that one of these saw a horizontal edge. What this is saying is, I'm going to light up, even if the hor whether the horizontal edge is right here in this specific location or a little bit moved over to the, the right or the left. So that's kind of an invariance, because we're able to recognize, say, a dog, whether the dog is here or it's here or it's here. We don't care if it's translated in the visual field. Or we don't even care if it's uh, you know, rotated a little bit or um, different parts of the dog are shown. So that's all about invariance. So the idea is in, in vision, the brain trades off between this specificity which means that we're very specific, we can recognize very specific instances of, of things, like edges or whole objects, and invariance, which means we're, we're able to uh, recognize them even if they're in different parts of the visual field or have some other kind of variation. So what this network is gonna do is it's gonna trade off between these layers that do specificity and these layers that do invariance. Up here, there's a new layer, which I um, call shape detectors. So these are edge detectors. These, um, these say I don't care what the, exactly where the edge is. And uh, each one of these gets input from a small number of these. And each one of these gets input from uh, some small number of these. And these each have, instead of a preferred edge, they have a preferred combination of edges, which you can think of as a shape. So these might, this one might have um, like the dog's ear, something like a, a, an upside down V as its preferred um, uh, input. And so these things get active, their activation is high if they see their preferred input coming from this layer and low otherwise. And then these take a kind of maximum over these preferred inputs all across the image. So um, I think I show this a little bit in the next few slides. Um, well, I should say, what, what is all this for? The job of this network is to produce some higher level representation of an image that will be useful for classifying what it is. So, I could give my computer program just the raw pixels in this image and say, what is it? Is it a dog or is it a cat, for example? Well, what this network is doing, and presumably what your brain is doing, is it takes that raw pixel, those raw pixel intensity values, and it processes them according to this kind of architecture where it looks for edges, and then it looks for shapes, and then it looks for more complex shapes, so that the higher part of your brain that actually figures out if it's a dog or, or a cat has something better than just pixels to look at. It has some more abstract, higher level representation. So that's what this network is trying to do. And then what we get at this layer is a, a set of values, which are the activation values. And this is a sort of a comp compressed description of the image in terms of how much certain shapes appear in that image. So what, this, what we see then, so these might, this might be an example of those numbers, you might say that there was a particular shape that appeared with a strength of 0.45, and I, I'm not telling you what those numbers actually mean, but you know, this shape appeared more strongly, and this shape appeared less strongly. And so it's a way of describing the image in this um, really um, reduced dimensional space where the original space of the pixel values is very high. There's a whole bunch of pixels, whereas here there's only some smaller number of uh, shapes that we care about. And uh, one question is how do we, how do we, how does this, the model learn what sh these shapes should be? Like how does it know to look for a dog like thing, and it learns that from data. I'm not really going to talk about exactly how that happens, but now we have this new representation of the image, and we can give it to a classifier. So here's a kind of classifier, a support vector machine, which is 
um, a kind of system that people use in machine learning that will learn from inputs like these to classify whether a given input is um, a dog or a cat, for example. Okay, or a dog or not a dog. Okay, and so this is just a black box. I'm not telling you how that works. I can later if you're interested. And so you can think about this as this, we can, this, this is something that has been trained by uh, images that have been labeled as dog or not dog. And it can now take a new image, complete this, get, uh, get this representation, and then decide whether it, it thinks it's a dog or not a dog. Okay, so the kinds of object recognition tasks that people have worked on a lot are things like, uh, is it a car? Is it a motorcycle? Is it a leaf? Is it an airplane? Sort of individual objects, completely divorced from any particular context. Um, you know, you can see here the leaf is in, in a picture with a bunch of other sort of random things like here the keyboard, paper, and so on. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that HMAX has been applied to. And here are some of the results that it got by looking at images like that. And just um, look at this uh, column. And this is from a paper by Thomas Serra et al. So this isn't, this isn't work that I did. This is work that the group at MIT did. And here it says, what is the accuracy in terms of percent of new object, class, object classifications, not things that it used to learn, but new ones, um, on these different categories of pictures like the ones I just showed you? And you can see it's pretty high. It's able to classify these categories, so leaf or not leaf, uh, car or not car, face or not face, and so on, at a pretty high accuracy. Okay? That's just looking at the whole image. But in, an in, in our task, like looking for trying to decide if somebody's walking a dog, we have to know where the objects are. So I don't, you know, it tells me dog or not dog. That's not going to help so much. I really want to know where the dog is. So um, you might have an object localization task, like find all the cars in the image. Find where they are. Tell me where they are, okay? These are real low resolution pictures uh, that came from an image uh, data set called the Street Scenes Database, which is um, some MIT, a bunch of MIT grad students went around Boston and took pictures of street scenes. And then um, people used them to uh, train HMAX plus a support vector machine to lo locate objects like car, pedestrian, bicycle, building, and tree. So how, how do you figure out where an object is? Okay, so if I'm looking at an image, how do I decide how do I figure out where the car is? Well, their solution was to look everywhere for it. Okay? Um, so the first part was just to uh, get, a, sorry, get a training set where I had little pictures that only contained cars. So I cropped out the cars from different images. And then um, trained, computed these features and trained the support vector machine. So I had, so we had, so these people had some support vector machines that could recognize cars. They had one that recognizes cars, one that recognizes people, one that recognizes uh, trees, and so on. Okay, now to find the, the car, you completely, you look, you just throw a bunch of these bounding boxes, that's what I call it, or windows, everywhere in the image at different sizes, and you say, is there a car here? Is there a car here? Is there a car here? Okay, you look all around there. And then you take the next category and you say, is there a person here? Is there a person here? Is there a tree here? Is there a tree here? And so on, for all of these things. And then you run, you compute those HMAX features in that box and you give it to the corresponding support vector machine. So is that clear, everybody? And if the support vector machine returns a score above some threshold, you know, some confidence, you say, okay, here's a car. Um, and if, the, if like this box says, yes, there's a car, and this box says, yes, there's a car, you have to figure out which one had a higher confidence. 
Yeah. So how good is HMAX at understanding that there's a car if you just show it a piece of a car, like a tire or, or a light? Humans can do that. Can HMAX um, if it's that? trained in the right way, yeah, okay. can do it. Okay, so um, this is what this um, work was, and it was able to detect cars somewhat well. It wasn't perfect. Like, for instance, it thought that parts of these buildings were cars. These are all these are detections where it said this is a car, and it doesn't get all the cars, but it's, it does uh, pretty well. But there's a problem with this, which is now I'm getting to the sort of uh, high-level cognition part. This didn't actually use any high-level cognition. It was all sort of this um, low-level uh, features that came from simple edges and shapes. And there's a problem, which is it had to look at every single part of the image to find uh, an object, to figure out where objects were. But we don't really do that, you know. People, psychologists do experiments where they actually do object eye tracking or looking at objects. And people are very good at very quickly zeroing in on, with their eyes, on where uh, objects are. And they don't waste a bunch of time looking throughout the whole, kind of doing a raster scan of the whole image, looking for objects, okay? And it also does, so it does an exhaustive search over window size. It does, it computes all of the features that every neuron, every simulated neuron uh, was used, which we don't necessarily do. Also worrisome is that this thing had about seven object categories that it knew about, and it searched every window for every object category. Well, how many categories do we actually know about? A lot. I don't know how many. Somebody uh, once estimated that we know uh, uh, 30,000 object categories, something like that. I forgot how many. You know, had to do with how many nouns there were. Uh, um, and that's not scalable, especially when we start talking about more complex of object combinations, like people, walking dogs, and so on. Yeah? Don't eye tracking experiments just uh, locate your phobia, so that even if you're fixating on one part, you, you, could you still take in the scene in your periphery, which um, would be processing in parallel? You could, yeah. Um, but um, people don't equally uh, focus their phobia on each part of the image. So um, they're very quick to focus on the object. So um, that's, you know, you can infer from that that they're able to sort of figure out using cues where the object is most likely to be. Okay, and finally, you know, this doesn't recognize these spatial and abstract relationships among objects that you need for understanding the whole scene. And it doesn't have any prior knowledge about sort of conceptual space, that is. Uh, for instance, a, a car drives on the road, or people tend to walk with other people instead of, you know, and they don't walk with buildings, or, you know, things like that. It has no conceptual space. So the question is, how do we uh, overcome these various limitations? Uh, there's, and there's no feedback from knowledge to allow any kind of context. So the goal of our project is to do to do this whole scene interpretation without this kind of exhaustive search by using feedback from conceptual knowledge. Um, okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's think about the dog walking problem. Here's some conceptual knowledge. This is what you might call an ontology or a semantic network. It has Symbolic concepts like, here's the situation of dog walking, okay? A person holds a leash that's attached to a dog, and they both have the action of walking, okay? So that kind of covers it, okay? Except, remember, computers take things very literally, and here there's not one dog, there's multiple dogs. Here the person isn't walking, they're running, okay? So we might 
say, well, let's extend those concepts a little bit. So we have, well, dog and dog group. Sort of, we allow that dog group kind of could, could substitute in for dog, or that running could substitute for walking. We would still have this concept, uh, an instance of this concept. Okay? And um, in our work, we call that conceptual slippage, which is a way to sort of the foundation of doing analogy, saying that a picture like this is an instance of dog walking, it clearly is, um, because we're allowed our concepts to be a little flexible. We don't insist there just be one dog. We don't insist that the person be walking. Okay? This is dog walking, sort of. I mean, you might, this would be in the same category as this. We think uh, that this person isn't exactly walking their dog, but it's within the sort of halo of that concept. Okay, here's another example where uh, this poor cat is being walked. So is this an example of dog walking? Would this be something that would be in this? No, no, it's not, but it's sort of also in this halo. So we might say, and here's somebody walking their iguana. Um, I didn't even know you could do that. But, um, so maybe those are not quite so good as so, so close slippages, and this one's kind of far away. But we'll say, OK, that's still in the same halo. OK, here's somebody walking their dog with their bike, um, walking their car, <laughs> walking their dog with their car. <laughs> and so these are kind of extreme examples, but they're still you know, things that we as humans would recognize as being in that category. So some of them are better instances of the category than others. And this is what um, psychologists call conceptual fluidity, the fact that our concepts are not rigid they're fluid, they're flexible, they can stretch, they can bend, they're, they're not, um, and you, know, you can probably think of some even more extreme examples um, than this. And um, that's really the hallmark of human ability to understand the world, which is being able to be flexible in this way. So this is really an analogy problem. This is an, uh, an al analogous to this and this and this, and we have to understand how people see that, how would they see that as being uh, the same basic concept. And so these slippages get even more preposterous and, you know, uh, here we have somebody walking their dog, quote unquote. Um, and so we start to bring, you know, we start to bring in all these different concepts that are related. And um, the question is, how can you model this on a computer so that a computer can do this kind of solution. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead in the uh, in terms of time, past all the wordy slides to the picture slide. So the active symbol architecture of Hofstetter um, is um, a architecture for trying to do this kind of conceptual slippage uh, in the context of analogy. So this is something that I worked on with Paul Stetter. Was a, a, he was my um, PhD advisor way back when. We, we worked on a program called Copycat, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, there's been other programs. These all do our analogy making programs. So here's Paul Stetter, and I don't, I don't know if anybody's seen this book called Fluid Concepts and Creative Analogies, Computer Models of the Fundamental Mechanisms of Thought, which um, is a book about all of these different models of making analogy via conceptual slippage. Okay. And there's something special about this book that, uh, or, or, or sort of unique about this book that um, probably you don't know, which is that it was the very first book sold on Amazon. Jeff Bezos sold me a copy. It was the first thing that ever made him any money. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of a unique uh, attribute of all of this work. OK, so here's how the uh, active symbol architecture works. Um, we have a semantic network, kind of like the one I showed you, and a workspace. The workspace is where um, a lot of these conceptual slippages will happen. And the way that these two things are connected is through these perceptual agents, which in earlier work we called codelets, the little pieces of code that are 
active symbols. So you can think of like the, the, that circle with dog in it as being a symbol. That's what people call it in AI. And symbols uh, often just uh, are passive in, in AI kinds of uh, projects where uh, a symbol will be sort of uh, a, a data structure that's manipulated by the program in some way, you know, using logical rules or something. But here we have so-called active symbols. You can think of them as little agents that go from concepts in the Smash network to instances of those concepts in the workspace and try to make sense of them. So let me show you how that works. And there's a, something called a temperature, which uh, regulates the amount of randomness in this system. OK, so what I'm going to do first is show you the copycat project, which used this um, architecture. And then I'll show you the work we're doing on extending that to use the HMAX model um, to produce an image understanding system. So here's an analogy problem, OK, using strings of letters. ABC changes its IJK. IJL, right. Most people will say IJL. Replace the rightmost letter by its successor. But you could also think of other possible answers. IJD, replace the rightmost letter by D, right? Maybe that's a little bit less uh, abstract. This is sort of taking literally the value of this letter rather than seeing it as a, a relationship, OK? IJK, replace all C's by D's. There's no C's here, so just leave it alone. Even more kind of boneheadedly uh, rigid. Or even, even more ABD, replace any string by ABD. So there's no reason logically why this should be any better than these, but this is the one that most people will give. And the reason is that even in this very abstract kind of situation, we have a sense of what's sort of the right level of abstraction to describe things at. And that's something that presumably has evolved in us for a reason, uh, that we use analogy to, uh, to do cognition, basically. Here's another problem. A, B, C changes to A, B, D. What does I, I, J, J, K, K change? <laughs> I, I, J, J, K, that's fair enough. Uh, most people will say, I, well, here's me rigidly applying the same rule before. Replace the rightmost letter by its successor. Okay, so you replace the rightmost letter by its successor. But most people won't answer that. They'll answer I, I, J, J, L, L because they see this as a group. So that's kind of analogous in a way to seeing the group of dogs. And this is a slippage. And notice I put quotations around letter because now we're not replacing the letter, we're replacing a group of letters but we're saying that it plays the same role as the letter. And that notion of playing the same role is the fundamental notion of analogy. OK, here's another one. I'll just go through this kind of quickly. This one, a lot of people, well, this is another sort of rigid application of the role. Replace the rightmost letter by its successor. But most people say, OK, well, ABC is going in one direction in the alphabet. K, IJK is going in the other direction backwards, so you could replace the, not the rightmost letter, but really the leftmost letter. Or you could see it going the other way, then you would not replace it by its successor, but by its predecessor. So you probably came up with one of those. OK? Here's one. ABC changes to ABD. What does XYZ change to? XYA. Now, suppose you can't say XYA that you don't have the notion that the alphabet is circular. X, Y, one OK. What if you just have to use letters? A, B, D. A, B, D. It's starting to look a little better here. Right, because you can't replace. Z has no successor. So a lot of people say this. We don't allow that in our world. Um, but sometimes what people do is they notice that this is the last letter in the alphabet. That's why you can't, it has no successor. That's kind of similar in a way to A, because being the first letter in the alphabet, that they go kind of are up against the wall. So you might map them like this and say, 
instead of replacing the rightmost letter by its successor, let's replace the leftmost letter by its predecessor. You're going to read out two slippages. And when you ask people to evaluate different answers, they, most people like this one, even though they don't come up with it. So it's kind of a creative answer. Okay, so um, the copycat program, um, I'm going to show you how it works, sort of. Um, okay, so let's see, the workspace. This is actually a, a program called Medicat, which is, another, which is a implementation of Copycat that was done by Jim Marshall. It's my, my version of it. It doesn't work on this computer. So let's see if I can. Hello. show you is here just the workspace. Um, let's try this problem. And I'll go a little bit slow to, so you can see what's happening. So what you're going to see, oh and I can also show you that um, there's a this concept network. You can't really read this, but this has all the concepts that the program knows about. All the letters of the alphabet and it knows about things like the leftmost, the middle, the rightmost, letter in a string. It knows about letters. It knows about groups of letters. It knows about sameness and oppositeness and some other simple concepts. And those are the concepts that are going to be, try, uh, the system's going to try and apply to the um, objects in the workspace. And it's going to do it by running these little agents that go from the concepts and try to apply them in a flexible way the workspace. And each one of these like little lightning bolts you see is one of those little perceptual agents trying to find some relationship. Um, and um, there's a lot of there's a lot of redundancy here. And but if there's some relationship that's found, like that these are both uh, the leftmost letter, then a structure is built to represent that. And here it says leftmost goes to leftmost. So that's kind of like a translation rule between this string and this string. It's trying to group these, this, these strings. This, these two are uh, grouped. It knows that K follows J in the alphabet, but it's trying to make, it has some bias to make bigger groups. So hopefully it will do that. Um, okay, so, so one group broke the other group. So it's, Let's speed it up a little bit here. Now it's been able to map everything. So it mapped, this, figured out that the C mapped to the D, and it described that as changed the letter category, the C, of the rightmost letter to its successor. And so it did the same thing here. Okay. And so what was what you probably did, didn't see here, but maybe you'll see if I show you this next one is it's not doing an exhaustive search of all possible concepts. But instead, it's using what it finds out. I'm going to show you the network now. Um, it'll be a little hard to show both on the same screen. But you'll just get kind of an idea of what the network's doing. Um, And you know, this problem, which is IIJJKK is the target. And what happens is, is that when structures are created by these codelets, it affects the activations, which are those circles, of different concepts. So it's saying the different concepts are relevant. And so here it found a successor, I mean a sameness, B to B, so that makes sameness very relevant. That makes sameness send out more agents to try and find instances of itself. When it found one of these sameness groups here, it was very much more likely to look next to it to find another sameness group. So it's using this sort of discovered context to avoid an exhaustive search of the space and 
make structures that fit in with the context that it's perceived. But there's actually a lot of randomness in the uh, there's sort of uh, probabilities here, so it doesn't always do exactly a deterministic search. Okay, so let's see what it is here. Uh, let's map the whole thing, these things to the groups, and uh, eventually it will try and find an answer. There we go. I I J J L L. Okay, so anybody want to propose a problem for it? So you don't think this is just a canned demo? <laughs> 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 yeah. What happens if you give it something that doesn't have like an obvious answer to it, like like A B C goes to J C A? And what would be the third string? And then uh, B E J. Okay, let's see what it finds. Uh, I'll make it fast here. So it's trying to find some structure. It found that B, you know, is, is the predecessor and the successor of A. to things related to it. 
okay? And so sort of the darker the, the um, little star shape, the um, higher the activation is supposed to be here. Okay, so these things are very low activation. And the things with high activation are much more likely to have perceptual agents that look for instances of themselves, like person, leash, dog, and so on. These are possible things that kind of are bubbling up in the background, maybe below the level of consciousness in some sense. We want to anthropomorphize. Um, so these have a low chance of being looked for. These have a high chance. Okay, so here's the in input. We do some pre-processing, which is uh, kind of weak segmentation, meaning that there, there's algorithms in computer vision that will take an image like this without any notion of what's in the image. It will just look at um, sort of a similarity between nearby pixels and will try and break up the image into different segments. So here's a segmentation. And you can see it did actually found this kind of black dog pretty well. And the person is sort of in there somewhere. And the other dog, here's the dog's head. But it doesn't have any knowledge, so it doesn't do a very good job. But this is kind of a starting point, which tells the program where to look. We call that a location heat map. So it's more likely to look in the centers of segments. And it's more likely to look at certain scales, which are the sizes of the segments. OK? So we have code loops now. And this, I should say, is this is a program that we're in the process of building. So only some of these things that I'm going to show you are actually uh, implemented yet. But So this is sort of the idea of how we expect it to work, rather than an actual run of the program. So unfortunately, I can't show you that yet. But the idea is that and it does do this so far. It figures out, it, it sends code lists to look in certain locations. Those locations are um, a sort of probabilistic um, values of these um, heat maps. So, so you know, there's some probability around here that it's going to look here, or here, here, here. And so it chooses a prob probabilistic boxes, just like that previous street scenes example. And it asks, is this a person? Is this a dog? Is this a dog? So it has no knowledge yet. But the only thing it knows is that there are certain segments that are probably more likely to be objects than others. And they have certain sizes. Um, and what these, these codelets do is they do a very quick test by sending in some very low level edge features to corresponding support, train support vector machine. And if there's a positive result, a new agent or codelet will, will be uh, posted to do a higher, sort of a, a more intensive uh, investigation by sending more high level features. Um, and so the idea is that the more promising it seems that this is, say, a dog, or this is a person, or this is a dog, those, um, those parts of, of the um, image get investigated more thoroughly. So we're not sort of random, we're not exhaustively searching. We're looking at things that are more promising. And so for instance, it may be that, I don't know if you can see this, this says it's negative, 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 positive that it's the outdoors, positive that it's the sidewalk, but 0 0.4, 0 0.8, this is a very high positive result that it's a dog. And so um, that gets looked at very quickly and gets assigned the category of dog. Notice it hasn't gotten whole dog. It might later be able to get a new box which gets the whole dog. Um, okay, now it's found a dog that makes it very much want to find a person and a leash. It's trying to see if a, this is a, a dog walking instance. Yeah. I'm just curious if, if all the uh, SVMs are trained only on images that are right side. So yes. If the dog is on a leash, but the owner stopped to scratch its stomach and it's on its back, it just lives in the air, it would classify it as 20% right. probability of the dog. Right, so, so there is some of that invariance that's built into the um, <coughs> network, the, the, the HMAX model. But yeah, it might do, not do as well. Okay, so now these heat maps have, have actually learned from the from training data, if 
you have a dog, you know that this is a dog, where the person is most likely to be, and how big the person is most likely to be. So that gives it some prior knowledge that it uses to look in specific places for person. And um, every time something gets discovered, these probabilities get updated to reflect that context from the, that is learned. So now it's trying to find person, okay, um, here it found person, okay, um, and that makes it very anxious to find a leash because it knows that that's the missing component. It looks for a leash here, here, um, but it's still looking for less uh, urgent things. I mean, it's always looking for dogs and people and leashes. Rope was one of the things that leash could slip to, so it has some low-level thing looking for rope. Found a, a, a leash, found a dog here, but it's weak. And later on, it, that competes with a stronger box that's a dog. Okay. And um, now that it's found objects, or while it's been finding objects, these relationships have um, started to get active. So now, once it finds objects, it wants to start finding relationships between them. So this is, a, this is not actually what the program does yet, but it's what we hope it will do soon, that it can actually group similar uh, categories, like dog and dog. It can identify whether the dog is in front of or next to the person. And it will do a search for relationships in the same way it did a search for objects. Um, and build these relationships. And finally, we have this um, variable called temperature, which is a measure of how organized the program is, and of how much good quality structures it's discovered. And when the temperature is low, there's a probability that this that uh, uh, agent for this whole situation will be um, run. It's a probabilistic depending on temperature. And what that will do is it will look, it will try to match this with a prototypical situation, okay, possibly allowing slippages. So here's the prototypical situation, okay, that tries to match the structures that have been built in the workspace with the structure in the concept network, okay. And it's able to do that, but the problem is here, this is what was in the network, um, that the dog was in front of the person, but actually here we have the dog next to the person, okay? And that it's not a dog, but a dog group. So we have to make some slippages. And if the resulting temperature after building those slippages is low enough, we classify the scene as positive. And the temperature uh, and, but if this, if this doesn't work, if it fails, it's not, um, the scene is not classified as positive enough time that it doesn't run for a long time, the program has an increasing chance of ending with negative classification. So if it's not able to make a positive classification, after some time it has a strong chance of just stopping and saying it's not a dog walking scene. Okay, so this is stuff that hasn't, we have, again, we haven't implemented yet, but the, this whole uh, beyond just looking at objects. Um, let me just say very briefly how temperature works. Um, it measures how well organized the program's understanding is by looking at those structures. Little organization is high temperature, lots of organization, low temperature. But the temperature will feed back to these codelets, meaning that the more, the higher the temperature, the more random the system is, the more less likely it is to pay attention to context that is perceived. The lower the temperature, the more deterministic the decisions are. And so the idea, the result is, and you saw this with uh, Copycat, that the system starts out being very random. That high temperature is high and lots of different things are tried out. It's very random, parallel, and bottom-up, but it gradually shifts to be more deterministic, serial, and, 
or top down, meaning that activated concepts are the ones that are getting uh, investigated. And this is really, um, propose, we propose this, as do others, as kind of a general law of how cognition uh, works, how the dynamic of cognition works. There's a lot of psychological evidence for this kind of view. Okay, so um, if a class applies the picture as positive, the temperature at the end is a measure of how good an instance it is. So if the temperature is high, it's not a very good instance, it's low, it's meant to be a good instance. So in summary, our program uh, is, avoids exhaustive search. And the, the way to think about that is to recall that street scene system, which does exhaustive search over window size and location, over the features, and over object categories. And in Pedicat, actually, the codelets use um, learned expectations and perceived context to decide where to look. They only look for these higher level features and windows that seem relevant. So um, it only requests features that are relevant to what the code lid is looking for. And finally, it looks for the object categories that are activated by context in the network based on prior expectations and what it's perceived. OK, so this is all about sort of relation to neuroscience, psychophysics, which I can tell you about if you want, but I'm running out of time. And I wanted to thank my collaborators, who are my um, graduate students at Portland State. And um, my collaborator at Los Alamos, who works on um, the Petavision project, Eric Kenyon. So thank you, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah. So in this case, you're starting with the question, is this uh, an instance of a dog being born? Yes. And that's the starting point for this category. Dog. That's right. How different would it be to just have the program recognize that the dog being walked up tell asking the question? So not giving a starting place. Then, that's yeah. very hard. To, that's very open-ended, right? And that means that it has to be able to distinguish that from all other possible situations. So we don't yet have like the concept network to do that. Or, you know, that's that's what people do. Okay. But we're starting from a simpler question. If you had a big enough context to recognize objects and try that's, to locate them near each other. The, that's the hope okay. that you know this will scale to different kinds of situations and won't just be limited to one kind of situation. But as it is now, there is really no programs that I know of that can even do that kind of simple situation. It, it's you know situation where you have um, a lot of different possibilities for how the situation, what the situation looks like visually. You know, it, it can recognize dog walking in general. That will be very, um, that will be very exciting. That's a great start. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it looked like the, the starting point was finding the small dog, and uh, then it, it tried to infer things from there. Mm -hmm. So can you say a little more about how how that spreads? Is it looking for things next to, or? Yeah, so the, it has, if I go back to, um, let's go back here. It learns from data, not only what a dog looks like, but if you have a dog, where you're likely to find a person, where you're likely to find a leash, where you're likely to find other dogs. So it, it it learns that kind of spatial spatial relationships, statistics about spatial relationships from, from data. And so it uses that, if it finds a dog over here, it has some sort of knowledge about relative to this location where you're likely to find the person and how big they're going to be. And that, that comes from uh, training, training data. images yeah. that are labeled. Yes, that's right. Uh, with the other groups that you showed, are they are we pursuing an identical strategy? You know, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, um, are there strategies in the field that are recognizably distinct, uh, or or are they all similar? Um, are they all similar? Well, so strategies. 
analogy to like this whole image understanding problem? Well, you show in the last slide you show the four different groups that are that are pursuing interactive vision. And I'm, oh, I, yes. I haven't read those papers, but I'm interested in knowing if they're following similar. Groups. These. In other words, is there a consensus in the field? Oh no, there's not really. These are these people are all neuroscience and psychophysics people, not computer vision people. But they're people who look at very similar questions about the brain. So like, for instance, uh, these are neuroscientists who say that V1 and V2 may work as active blackboards that integrate and sustain computations performed in higher areas. So it's the idea of a, uh, uh, our workspace is similar to that. Uh, Kahneman, Treisman, and Gibbs talk about object files, which are, they have a theory that uh, in memory and perception, we, we have sort of these uh, perceptual structures like the ones that we have. Churchill and Ramachandran and Sanofsky talk about interactive vision, which has, has to do with, um, for instance, this interaction between these top-down and bottom-up processing. And Treisman et al. Uh, talk about this shift between parallel, random, bottom-up, and more deterministic, serial, top-down. So these, these are just sort of support from neuroscience and psychophysics for some of the ideas that we're pursuing. In the computer vision community, though, um, there are a lot of people who are pursuing similar goals, but they're doing it in rather different ways. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, how do you decide what levels are the low levels and what levels are the high levels? So, um, say you use the recognition of a dog as a fundamental thing, but a dog is also made of pieces. Um, right. A dog has you know, parts and incorporate that into your conceptual network and just have the lower level, you know, some limb or tail or something like that, right. and learn all that together. What right. are the trade-offs? Right, that's a very good question. So um, here, I, obviously, I have a separation, but I don't think that's the way it really is in the brain. I think we have these kind of hierarchical models at many different levels. You know, we have a hierarchical model of where a dog is, we have a hierarchical model of what taking the dog for a walk is, we have a hierarchical model of, you know, some concept beyond that. You know, a dog park consists of people playing with dogs and taking dogs for walks. You know. So it's hierarchical models all the way down, if you like, down to sure. the edges. And we haven't, we, we're just sort of artificially separating them because it's sort of how we're starting to do this. But we're not trying to do a, a complete model of how vision works in the brain. So this is trying to actually more in the AI world where we're trying to actually get the program to do something that we consider to be uh, human-like. Yeah. I'm, doing, I'm thinking about those images, the various humorous ones, a little far-fetched of people walking dogs, all the various things that might be interpreted, you know, including a helicopter and a guy. And yeah, and a dog or, walking a dog. Is, is the output of your thing just digital, yes, no, is this a person walking a dog, or can your network say, well, actually, this is a person walking four dogs, or this is, uh, you know, an automobile, maybe a right. person in automobile is one of your more remote links right. or something like that. Um, so you, right now, your metric, your output, your metric, right. Your success or so right now, the, the the output is yes or no, okay. but there is a, a, a measure of quality. Like yes, it's it's. A, I'll call this the dog walking image, but I'll call it a, kind of a low quality because it's not really a dog; it's a cat. I mean, our network can't do our program can't do that yet. But that would be the idea. Um, you know, one one application you might think of is um, if you want to do sort of an image retrieval task, like you want to say, sure, you have this big database of images, say, you know, on the web or something. Find me all the pictures of uh, dog walking. And the question is, would you want um, walking a cat to be included? Maybe you would, but maybe you'd want it ranked lower. <laughs> um, but you would want it classified as positive. But so, um, so there is, um, a, a me measure of quality. But there's also, um, you can think of these structures as part of the output. 
And so this, the structures tell you that actually it's not a dog, but a group of dogs. And so it doesn't count how many dogs there is, so it doesn't know that there's four dogs, but it can tell you that there's a group of dogs. <laughs> Um, that's, that's big. I mean, that's a lot more information than just digital, yes or no. Right. So it, tell, it kind of explains via these structures why it's telling you that it's an instance. Yeah. How many things that would require you to make this more? The question was how many tra training examples are there that we need to make the system work? And that's, uh, you know, the system will probably work better at recognizing dogs, you know, it doesn't, it's not always perfect, it gets fit wrong, it gets false uh, positives and false negatives. Um, the more training we have, the, the more training examples we have. So, um, you know, we've been collecting a, our own um, pictures to create a training set of dogs, people, people walking dogs. And right now we have in the order of the, uh, like the high hundreds of examples, but we probably need them the more like the high thousands. That's one of the disadvantages, you know, or it's one of the challenges. Um, people, on the other hand, don't need that many examples, presumably. I don't really know, but um, one of the things that are, we think, although we haven't, we really can't tell yet, is that the fact that we're using this higher level um, knowledge will help us even if our dog recognition recognizer is not very good. So that's one of the ideas is that this top-down feedback part will, even if you have like not such a good dog recognizer, because it's using context and knowledge, it might be able to do a better job. And that's something to test. Yeah? Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, what complexity concepts are you using? What complexity concepts? Um, <laughs> I guess this is a complexity group. Huh? Um, well, we certainly have um, a, a sort of an agent-based system with lots of decentralized agents trying to produce uh, an outcome that's beyond any one of them to produce. So maybe that's the answer to that. Yeah? To what extent are you trying to produce a device that would replace the eyes of somebody who is blind? Um, I'm not, uh, we're not really trying to do that at all. Um, so that's not one of the goals of this project. Um, we're so far from that. I mean. That's not realistic. Well, I mean, it, in a way it is. Um, people who are blind, um, there are prosthetic like retinas and things. I mean, I guess it depends on the kind of blindness it is. Um, and it depends on how much sort of sight the person had before they went blind. So if they've already kind of learned, to, evidently you really need to learn to see at a very young age, or else you'll never be able to see, even if your blindness is cured. Um, there's kind of a critical period where you have to, you have to be able to get visual input. Um, so I, don't, I haven't really thought about that kind of question with respect to this. It's interesting. But I mean, you're, you're trying to do something much more ambitious than that. You're trying to replace the pieces of the brain that recognize that it's not the eye that right. has the low level of coding. Yeah. Um, well, there's a smooth continuum between yeah. the kind of uh, pre-robotic uh, computer vision that you're doing that would enable a robot to see and a prosthesis that you would give to a blind or impaired uh, human being to say, to tell it uh, what's going on yeah. in front of them, and to watch out or right. So you might have opportunity. You might think of this like implemented in some kind of wearable device <laughs> that a blind person could wear, and it would it would eventually. I mean, I'm not saying that our project is going to do this, but eventually it would do what Marvin Minsky wanted to do, which was have the camera describe what it sees. Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's, uh, you're working on the holy grail of the field. Right. Seeing understanding. Right, and that's, you know, we're, we're, we're not obviously nowhere close to being there yet, but this is, I just wanted to describe our approach to it. Yeah. Can you compare it a bit more to the, um, 
early example of finding cars, which is sort of exact, exhaustive searching. Is this supposed to be sort of faster or more accurate? Yeah, faster and more accurate. You still have to start with the random search, right, to find well, something. Well, we start with a, you know, we have some prior knowledge coming from our weak segmentation. And we might have other prior knowledge learned that we've learned from images. But it starts out very random. But as soon as it learns something, as soon as it finds something, it uses that, the thing that it's found to create some context that allows it to be more, uh, to be better at finding other things as opposed to compared to just random search. So if you wanted to redo the car thing, would you sort of break the car down into like component parts and then search for those? Or how, how do you use You this? could do that, or you, could, or you could use some knowledge about where cars are likely to be. In an image, you might recognize the street. Or you might recognize, you know, uh, pedestrians or something and try and make sense of the scene and use that to constrain your expectations about where a car is likely to be. And people do that kind of thing, actually. I mean, that we're not the only people working on this kind of thing. So, but there's a lot of different ways to try and implement that. And nobody's really gotten, I would say, very far on that yet. And that, that was your point about being able to deal with a weaker dog detector. Right. Like the, the car shouldn't be on the side of the building on the third floor, like in one of those examples. Right, right. If I'm pretty sure because of context that this should be a dog, even if I'm not confident from just the image itself that's a dog, I'd be more likely to call it a dog. And the guess is that it would be more often it would be correct. Yeah. How how accurate are the programs that recognize a face? Or um, a fingerprint? They're getting very accurate. Depending especially well, fingerprints are pretty well controlled. But faces, the problem is that people can be in like very different lighting, or they can like I can see my face like this, or like just a little of it, or I'm wearing a hat, or, or a beard, or whatever, right? Um, and those things can give problems for uh, face recognizers. But if your face is like, you have a face that's kind of in a controlled lane and pretty much looking at the camera, I think they're quite good. And you you know, you see the, that on like Facebook and other kinds of uh, web applications that can do that. Yeah, there are two, I mean, there are two different problems that, uh, that he's talking about. One is that, is it is it a face versus a car? Right. And then, is it Bill Newsom's face? Right. Versus, uh, versus a car? Right. And uh, I think their programs are pretty good at both of those. They're especially good at finding a face. Like, you know, your digital camera can do that. It's find a face. Sometimes it gets it wrong. But uh, they're, they're, they're quite good at find, like, if I took a picture, uh, there's algorithms that can really do very well picking out most of the faces in this room as faces. As for recognizing who they are, um, if it has enough training, it, it, those algorithms are pretty good at it. As long as they're not, like the faces aren't sort of hidden or obscured or distorted in some way. Yeah. So, I might be misunderstanding the concept, but if the, if, let's say you're looking for a car, and the car is out of context, like on the or something, would this have a problem with that? Does it have a problem with creating the, yeah. the meaning of the situation? Or the yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be able to use context to help figure out where the car is. If the car is just like pasted on some weird scene that makes no sense. Is there any evidence that humans have a similar problem? It seems like if you show a child a picture of a car in your situation, they have no problem. They have, I think that there is, if, the, if it's kind of buried, if it pops out at you, yeah, there's no problem. But if it's kind of buried in clutter, it's not popping out at you because it's, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff and you have to say, where's the car? And there's like a, a, a table with, you know, a bunch of random toys on it. Mm -hmm. One of them's a toy car. There's all kinds of toys in the toy car. There's no reason it pops out at you, for, you know. Um, it would be really hard, you know, they have to search very uh, okay. systematically to find it. I think that even the, the question of is it a car or not, you can show pretty easily that it's very context dependent. Because if you look at this picture right here, and if you're to take away all the stuff laid on top of it, and if you just showed, you know, the top, you know, tiny little bit, like there's a car in that picture. If you only showed somebody that tiny picture, 
it's very smeared, it's very pixelated. My guess is most people, yeah, you, you ask people what is that, most people would say, I don't know, it you know, kind of looks like there's stripes in it. But if you show them the entire picture, almost everybody's able to immediately look at this entire picture and say, oh, there's a road that somebody's walking on, therefore I, you know, it must be a road. And so if there's this thing in the background, mm -hmm. then that little thing sticking out must be a side mirror, and so it's got to be a car. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of how context yeah, really aiding the understanding of that. Right, no, that's um, a good point. But it's human sometimes do that, but they don't always do that. So. Right. Sometimes you get, you, you see, you, you make mistakes because of that. You, know, you expect that to be a car, but it turns out it's really a, I don't box or something. Yeah, something that you might not expect to be there. All right, well, does the software do better with sort of stylized images? We have we haven't tried that at all. I haven't tried this. That's a good question. You mean like uh, by stylized you mean like uh, cartoons? Yeah, like yeah. Much yeah. simpler, less busy and just getting the essence of the shapes. Yes. No, we haven't tried that. All right, I think we're done. Thank you.